Welcome to ADHD is over, a new podcast on a seemingly old label that we're going to be peeling off. Join my wife, Tatiana, and I as we journey with our family, the Wyden family, through the land of confusing information. We're going to visit both sides and let you decide because the power is with you. Welcome to ADHD is over. Here we are again on our podcast today, joined by my wife. Hello, Tatiana. Hello. It is a pleasure to have you on uh, often. And what you're hearing there is uh, two dogs outside. We have uh, Max, our own dog, and Roxy, who's visiting, who is our guest EJ's dog. We're about to introduce EJ. Um, I just wanted to say it's a pleasure to have my wife here because often we don't find a time to both be on. So I do the podcast. I lead it. I interview. But it's always great to have you on. Thank you. This is fun. Yeah. It's going to be great because we're going to just work it all in. So our guest today is EJ. Hello, EJ. Hello. Sounds like a mystery guest, but he's not. Uh, EJ is a uh, dear friend, um, a fellow human being who's committed to becoming a better human being by, by the day. Um, every day. Every day. He's someone who uh, is truly soul searching. Uh, we're going to let him talk about what he does, who he is. But today EJ is on the podcast to talk about his past uh, dealing with ADHD or mental disorders and being labeled and being given medication and how to how he had to function in the family unit. And again, this is for those of you listening. Um, I am here. Uh, I would say EJ is a testament of a young man who post medication, post label, uh, turned out, quote unquote, right? EJ is making something of his life. And so I think it's important to know that whatever he went through was part of getting here. And uh, so why don't we dive right in? Uh, EJ, thank you for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Edward Zapata and Chavez Jr. Uh, I go by EJ because my, I'm named after my real dad, but uh, it'd be weird to have two Edwards in the house, so <laughs> I went by EJ. Uh, I thought that that was a nickname uh, given to me by myself, but it turned out my mom actually gave me that nickname. So my family calls me EJ, my friends call me EJ. Everywhere I go, I'm EJ. Well, it's a pleasure to have the original EJ here. Yeah. Uh, take us back to your childhood, uh, perhaps to the point where you were told or where you felt that you were different from other kids. And perhaps, I know we've talked about this before, you can also talk about how when you came to this country, or, I mean, you, you were the only one born here, right? That's right. So when they came to the country, and even though you were born here, there was you still felt different, obviously, Um from your background, right? From your family, but you can work that in as well. But when did you really feel like something is, doesn't seem right or maybe I'm, I'm broken or I'm not mm. normal, mm. right? Um, uh, growing, we, I grew up in, in New York City and uh, we moved there from Jersey City when I was around five or six. And mm, I, I actually used to really enjoy school uh, I, I love being social. I love meeting people. And so that part was always really wonderful for me. And then uh, I started getting into trouble. Uh, I don't exactly know why I started getting into trouble, but, you know, we're kids. Mischief happens. And um, my classmates and my teachers would start to notice that uh, I had a little bit more energy than everyone else. And... Um, at, at some point, I, I started getting expelled for, <laughs> I, uh, this is something that I always forget to mention, but I would take my stepdad's um, dirty magazines and sell them at school. Oh, my God. Entre uh, entrepreneur waiting yeah. to happen. <laughs> yeah. My, my mom and my, 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 my parents would give me money for lunch, of course, and um, I think the lunch was $1.50. But every week I would only get five dollars, so I had to figure out how I was going to eat the other days, and I, wow. I started just taking things from the house and started selling them at school. Wow. <laughs> and um, you know, dirty magazines were a really hot commodity. Um, I can think of the URL. It would be instead of eBay, it would be <laughs> ejbay.com. <yeah. laughs> <laughs> it was definitely uh, I w that was the first that was the first time I, I got um, suspended, and then. That was like the first big thing that happened. And then all of a sudden, you know, 
it was you know the whole family found out everybody was like oh he's he's naughty he's a he's a bad kid and um shortly after that uh i did something else you know maybe it was um acting out in school or a fight or something and then i got suspended again and then by second grade um my my teachers would start to notice that uh, i would be coming to school with injuries and my stepdad would uh, discipline us, mostly me, because I, I was a little bit more rambunctious. And to, to my knowledge, I thought that those being, being disciplined was normal. And I'm sure uh, across the board in America and, and all over the, I'll actually probably all over the world, being disciplined was not so out of the box. At the time, right? Yes, it's, definitely at the it's time. It's interesting. I just saw somebody posted on a, one of the groups and it said, uh, I, I had ADHD until my father's belt came mm-hmm. off. And that's a whole nother topic, but I get that there was a generation where that was just the, the you straighten up, like, mm-hmm. you know, so, and, or at least they expect you to straighten up. Yeah. From, yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that works for some kids. Uh, it did not work for me. Right. Um, I, I was, I was never actually afraid of, uh, getting disciplined. <laughs> I mean, I, I continued to just get, you know, more and more difficult as the years grew on. Um, I, I'd have, I actually, I thought about writing a book about how many times I've been suspended and all the things that I did. And I thought that'd be an interesting thing to look at, but I, I honestly, I should find out, but I don't know how many times I've been suspended, <laughs> but I have been expelled once. Maybe you can just make it up and be like 101 ways how to get expelled, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, this is, this is how not to be in school. <laughs> um, but around, around that time when the teachers started to notice that I would come to school uh, injured, they would inquire like, Hey, what, what, how did, you know, where did this come from? What, where is this, you know, what is this, what's going on? And, uh, uh, usually I would lie about it, but, uh, at some point I was like, you know what, I think I'm going to tell the truth. And Mm -hmm. so I said, you know, my, my dad, uh, disciplined me for, you know, this or that. And that's when the school stepped in and this is in public school in New York city. So there's only so much that they're able to do. Um, but they mandated somebody to come to the, to, to our house to see what was going on. And then, uh, doctors came in and therapists came in and then eventually I, I became medicated and, uh, I, I didn't know about any diagnosis as a kid and it wasn't until I was older. Um, when my, when I had a conversation with my mom, I was like, Hey, uh, remember when I used to go see therapists and doctors and I would, mm-hmm. you know, do I think I took a pill every day. What, what was all that? And that's when my mom told me, she's like, Oh, you know, you, you have ADHD and, um, uh, you were diagnosed with autism back then. And I, I was like, huh. And this was Pat, this was post yes, this the is, inspection of your, uh, uh, stepdad's, uh, uh, domestic, what do they yeah. call it? Child, not yeah. physical abuser. Mm-hmm. This, so, so they came in and they, determined that yes he was uh, going a little too far with the physical abuse mm-hmm. and then also said but on top of that yes you do have ADHD and you do have autism and then medicated you yeah Is that kinda I, how- I don't really understand um, what the whole investigation process was but it went from uh, you know hi Roxy Hello, it Roxy. went from it went from them like, you know, police officers talking to my, my parents to also doctors talking to me at the same time. Mm-hmm. And somewhere along that process, uh, so it's also hard for me to remember that time. Sure, um, sure. For, once I started getting medicated, I don't really, re- I don't have many memories of that time. So from second grade to maybe eighth grade, um, my memories are pretty unclear. And it's, it's, it's weird uh, my timeline is, is also really off. I really don't even know where and what and when happened. And you feel that that is a result, a sort of a side effect of just kind of droning through through school and droning through life or shutting things out and just being yeah, compliant? Yeah. I couldn't tell you what the dosage was. I couldn't tell you what the pill looked like. I couldn't mm. tell you what it was called. Um, you still don't know what, what you were taking? No, not at all. Not mm. at all. I just remember taking it every day. And I remember there was uh, a bit more peace in the house during that time. Um, when, because you took it or just during the time, coincidentally, the family was more peaceful? 
well, I, I, I think I just wasn't able to notice things anymore. Mm. So there was definitely other things happening. Uh, I just, you know, I wasn't paying attention anymore. I think um, uh, I spent a lot more time inside. I spent a lot more time in front of the television. I spent a lot more time playing video games. Um, but that was a, you know, a different period that I just don't really know much about. Mm-hmm. But it was around it was around second or third grade because that was when I was getting into a lot of trouble at school. Mm, got it. So, so now you're diagnosed, right? You have an official diagnosis. You are on medication. You are. I'm assuming your grades were okay. You were doing okay. Was that sort of the academics? My, were a my problem, grades or? were always okay. Even 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 when I was not medicated, my grades were always okay. I never had uh, necessarily really bad grades, but I never really had good grades either. Yeah, sounds I like was, my I life. always passed. Yeah. I always passed. No matter what, I was passing. Oh, you're, you and I are passing brothers because mm-hmm. I did the same thing. I was like, yeah, I passed. Yeah, someone taught me C's get degrees, and I just, you know, <laughs> I just kept, there we go. kept going with that. Now, um, so I just so basically, what I'm hearing is the medication didn't necessarily improve your academic performance. They just calmed you down so that everybody was happy that you were no longer a disruptor. Mm. Yes. But, uh, I also forgot to mention that once I was on medication, I was also no longer taking classes with, uh, the regular students. I was, I was now in a special education system where, you know, a very special bus would come pick me up from school. I wouldn't go to the bus stop anymore where all of my, uh, mm. classmates or my previous classmates and my neighbor's kids were there. Uh, instead I would get picked up uh, much earlier than the rest of the kids because I was now going to a different school uh, across the city. Mm-hmm. And, and what um, did that do to you, knowing that you now see yourself being... Was there a, a label attached to that that came with yeah, it? Is absolutely. there a label that you gave yourself or that you felt you were given? What what was... It's, it's interesting. Um, I, I, I never gave myself any labels. Um, mm-hmm. I'm also a Filipino-American. But in New York City, as a kid, it doesn't really matter what race you are. If, you're, if your eyes look a certain kind of way, you're Chinese. Mm. And so once I also was taking a special bus, I became the retarded chink in the neighborhood. Mm. And, and that sounds really painful, mm-hmm. but those words were used so much that I was kind of desensitized by them. Mm. And, and I'm sure there's probably uh, pain that I, I felt during that time. But eventually I just, you know, rolled with it and I just let it, I just let it happen. Mm. But definitely, um, uh, I never thought I, 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 to this day, I didn't think I was too different than everybody else. Yeah. I just wondered why I was treated differently. Mm. Cause I thought, I, I always thought I was normal. I never thought I was different. I thought I was normal. I thought everybody else was kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> and what did you think made the mm. difference for you that you didn't, you you were able to keep yourself from taking on that label as yourself. You knew you were clear. What I'm hearing is that you were clear who you were, and it was something external side of you. What gave you that? What would you attribute to you having such a strong sense of identity, despite what was happening, despite the circumstances of that were? You know, I had a conversation with my older brother, and. Um, Growing up, my older brother was a very large part of my life, and I, I completely forgot about this, but he, I, you know, I, I saw him as my hero, I, I, I copied everything he did, he loved to play chess, I loved to play chess, he loves puzzles, I love puzzles, mm. um, he liked certain video games, I like certain video games, and then, um, so he's also five years older than me, and his name is Edmund, it's also what we call him, I call him Kuya, which means big brother in Tagalog. Um, but growing up, we competed for everything. He always won, but that never bothered me because it was my chance to just, you know, play with my brother. Mm -hmm. So from video games to handball, to basketball, to running, to climbing, to, to anything, even chess, we, we did all these things and I would compete, you know, as if I was his equal and he treated me like his, his, I was his equal. He never let me win. He always, he always, you know, I always lost, but it wasn't because he was mean. 
he just always thought that I was one step behind him. And he, he worked really, he, he told me this. He said he always had to work really hard because I was trying so hard to catch up and he never wanted me to catch up because wow. he thought, you know, if he, if I caught up, then he would lose that big brother part. He kept on all his toes. Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, he never once thought of me as somebody that was inferior. He, he always just thought that uh, he won because he was older and had more experience. He never, he never once thought that I was um, lesser. He just mm. thought I, was, I wasn't here as long as he was and I didn't have as much experience. Mm. That's interesting because you, you had mentioned something earlier when we talked about how your mother um, instilled in you that mm-hmm. you could do anything, mm-hmm. right? And so I'm wondering how did they... Did they themselves kind of just like label and medicate because that's what the doctors said, but they really still knew that, well, I, I still think my son can do anything. Were, mm-hmm. they, were they that positive that you got that from them? That's, that's a really, uh, I, so I don't have much of a um, verbal communicative relationship with my mom. We don't really talk about things, but I, I do remember that um, no one was allowed to treat me differently. Mm. No one was like in my family, um, my cousins, no one was allowed to, you know, uh, talk about me as if I was, Mm. you know, um, as if I was special or I was different. Mm -hmm. Everyone treated me exactly the same way they treated me, even after I was diagnosed. No one ever treated me special. Mm -hmm. Um, But they knew about it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And the, the, the hard part is, is that the kids, you know, my cousins, my sisters, my brothers, everyone treated me exactly the same way. But I did notice that the adults would talk about me behind my back. Mm. And it's something I, I, I like, I would listen and I would hear it. And it kind of just made me go, oh, hmm, I can't wait to prove you wrong. Mm. And, and, and I, I always noticed that my, my cousins and my, and my brothers, they, they've known me from the beginning. When I was growing up in Jersey City, uh, I lived with my entire family. Everybody uh, immigrated here from the Philippines and I was the first to be born in America. But we shared like a two bedroom apartment with my aunts, my uncles, my cousins, my grandparents, my mom, my brother, my sister. All of us were in one little space. Wow. So we were all best friends. We we saw each other every day. Yeah. Um, my grandmother was the caretaker, but also the babysitter. And right. and she walked us to school every day. Wow. So it was like it was like a true tribe. Oh, yeah. You guys had a- oh, yeah. Oh yeah, everybody, everybody um, participated in some way and helped the whole thing move. Yeah. You know, my, my, my aunts, they all worked and they all helped pay for the space. Everybody helped pay for the food. Everybody helped make the table. Like it, mm-hmm. it was a pretty well uh, wow. run unit. Everybody was doing something except for me because I was the youngest. So everybody was, everybody was doing something. And then one person had to make sure that I, I was, I wasn't, <laughs> uh, you know, breaking anything. Yeah. Or climbing, you know, the walls. Wow. And so that's fascinating to me because it sounds like then, and that that's part of the, the, the next part of the story is like that tribe didn't last, right? You didn't stay there, mm-hmm. uh, continuing that story. So where yeah. did, where did you go from there? So my mom, uh, she met my stepfather, uh, they got married and when they married, that was around, um, second grade. And that's when I left New Jersey to go to New York city and moving from Jersey City to New York City meant that I was n- going to be a much further away from the family that I had just spent all this time with. Um, but, you know, New York City is a very different beast altogether. Sure. Yeah. But uh, I, I loved it. But I, I just didn't realize how much of an effect it would have on me to not be around those people that I spent Mm -hmm. all of my years before Mm -hmm. and now I only saw them special occasions Mm -hmm. and so you're now with your mom and stepdad my mom my stepdad my brother and my sister in a house so the five of you Mm -hmm. and you were you said second grade I was I think because I I remember my first uh grade in New York City was second grade yes so the divorce or the split and the new sort of family life happened around six seven years old Mm. Oh, I, I forgot to mention, but I never, I, I wasn't around my real father growing up. So I, I, I think I might've had a phone call with him once before when I was younger and he might have written me a letter uh, that I used to have. Um, but I didn't actually know him. I never, I never met him until I, I think I was 27. Yeah. So before that I had, I have no, I didn't even know what he looked like. I think there was a picture somewhere in the house, but 
you know, at, once my mom moved in with my stepdad, I never saw that picture again. No. Well, it sounds as well that, that your brother, did your older brother also play like a role in being your a figure that you could? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Look up to and. Oh yeah. My yeah. my brother probably doesn't even realize just how much mm. he played into my upbringing. Maybe he does by now because we talk about it, but. Um, I think, I think all of my role model was just him figuring out what it was like to be one, um, you know, he, he didn't have his dad either and he never thought of my stepdad as his dad and he never considered him as a role model. So he was very much alone. So him figuring all of that out was like his process was my process because mm. whatever he learned is what I was learning. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So it sounds like that's where most of the uh, keep going or I can do this or I'm mm-hmm. going to do it anyway mm-hmm. came from, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, now, so you're in New York City and you're definitely, after all this that you mentioned before, where you got labeled, medicated. Mm-hmm. Um, how did other kids treat you other than the family that knew that, that basically was going to treat you the same, mm. right? Um, how was how was it growing up in New York um, being treated by other kids, or what were they saying about you? I was I was uh, verbally bullied a lot, um, and it was it was very clear that uh, many of the kids. But but to be honest, I thought it was more about race than it had to do with intellect. Yeah, I was just going to say that yeah. um, because it wasn't until maybe. Uh, I actually don't remember, but it, I think it, was, it wasn't until middle school that I, I started being called retarded. But before that, I was always just called a chink or uh, like they would bring out like Jackie Chan or Jet Li or Bruce yeah. Lee. And, and so I, I like, you know, everybody knew my name, you know, everybody took attendance <laughs> every day. Everybody knew my name, but they always called me by another, you know, Asian person. Mm. And when you when you say retarded, was that were, were they referring to all special ed kids that way? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Especially because you know, if we're walking through the halls as a as a group, I'm walking with the special kids, and and uh, I don't know how it is now in New York City, but at the time, all kids that were special were in the same class. So that meant that if and, and it had nothing to do with intellect. It just had to do with I think the difficulty of dealing with them. Because I, I was also in, in a classroom that were, they weren't even the same age. There was, mm-hmm. I remember one of my friends on the block, his brother had, um, I don't exact, I think it was cerebral palsy, but he couldn't, he had very difficulty using all of his limbs in the way that he wanted to. But he was, he was there, like he was very much aware. He was very, you know, he knew things. It's just that he had a hard time with his motor skills. But he was in my class, and I right. think he was at least two years younger than me. And then there was another kid who just had emotional problems, um, probably similar to me. I, I don't know anybody else's diagnosis, only that one because he was my friend. But uh, all of the kids were in that class with me. And then there was there was another one who was missing um, a few limbs. And so it, it just pretty much all kids who weren't like the other kids were put in this classroom. Wow. Mm-hmm. So it's like if you weren't normal, yeah. Right, yeah. right. I yeah, mean, yeah. that speaks of kind of the rudimentary structure that the educational system currently has. If there's some, you know, it's not necessarily based on, you know, what is best for you, how you learn, but rather like if you're slightly different from the rest, like just bucket you all together. Mm-hmm. It's, I mean, even, I think even, even if we just said, okay, there's a lot of kids that are not normal, meaning they don't learn the normal way, the normal way is usually the left brain kind of like structured. Mm-hmm. Um, let's not call it special ed. Let's call it, they're the other kids who are more right brain, uh, more creative, more, they need more attention. They need more, you know, whatever it is, or, or they're dealing mm. with stuff at home. Right. Mm-hmm. So, um, it's again, you know, your story solidifies what we've always been feeling that, we're so behind with the mm-hmm. public education. We're, we're still calling it special ed, which is basically still Oh, I same, didn't know that. You know, yeah, it's still special ed. Like, mm. you know, um, and it's like, what does that mean special, mm. right? Or what are we hiding here? Oh, I almost forgot. That was my other nickname. Special? Special ed. Oh, I really? Forgot. Yeah, I totally forgot. Wow. That's, oh, that's a big one. Mm-hmm. Special ed. 
It's it's kind of funny, but there was there was a moment where uh, I think I just took charge of it and I I let it I let that be whatever my label was, and I was like, okay, well then I'll show you what this special ed can do. Yeah, well mm-hmm. to me that's what's fascinating that you know it could go two ways. You can have that be an empowering thing mm-hmm. of like you know what I will show you, or you can other kids or could have taken it as a negative identifier of themselves and and um and take it as a insult you know, as an insult exactly oh, yeah. and really oh, yeah. affected it deeply but it's like what makes the difference between one going one way or the other right it's well there's there's the two paths right one is like i'll show you which mm-hmm. you did and then the other one is like poor me yes or i'm should yeah. just give up i i think i think um this had a little bit to do with and, and i'm learning this um um uh, my my really close friend of mine and my mentor Philip talks about this all the time, but anger isn't a primary emotion. It's a it's a combination of fear and sadness, or one or the other. And um, you know, I I was definitely angry when people would say that mm-hmm. because of how obviously how sad it made me, and also afraid of you know what if they're right. Mm-hmm. But um, sometimes when I'm angry, I, I'm a doer. I like to do things. I like to do a lot of things. So when somebody would make me upset, I want to. I want to react and do something. And, um, I never thought like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to hurt this person for, for saying that about me. It's more like, I'm going to express myself and show them that they're wrong. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think part of that came from my brother because it made no sense to me that I can compete with somebody who's five years older than me. Mm. And, 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 you know, maybe I was never close to winning, but it felt like I was always really close, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so, what a so gift. I what was a like, gift there's you. no way, there's no way that I can almost be somebody five years older than me, who I think is the smartest person ever and like the strongest and the fastest. And he kind of was, you know, just looking around that there really wasn't much people that could compete against him. And he, he used to compete in Kung Fu. He did Muay Thai and he, he loved chess. Uh, our grandfather loved chess. So he loved chess. And he would, he would, you know, compete in chess uh, tournaments and, and do really well. And, you know, so I, I kept seeing him win. And so when I saw him win, I was, I was like, okay, if he's winning and I'm really close to beating him, then I've got to be, you know, somewhere up there with him, right? I've got to be close. <laughs> and so whenever I would get these labels and people would talk to me or, or, tell, or talk down about me, I'm like, no, it's impossible. There's no way that that's true mm. if I'm this close to my brother. Mm. Mm. Wow. So you had a barometer that you made real for yourself. As oh, one hundred percent. I'm up there, and you just don't see it. Mm-hmm. Which is sounds to me like exactly the recipe for going in the right direction versus giving up versus becoming somebody who doubts themselves. You know, mm-hmm. who goes into basically a victim mode. Mm-hmm. And I say this with love, right? It's easy for us to go into victim mode. So you didn't. Um, well, I, I will say I definitely had some hard times. There was definitely moments where I would feel sorry for myself. I, I've definitely cried myself to sleep many times. And one one ongoing thing that is still prevalent in my life is my, my inability to get uh, an abundance of sleep. I've always had a hard time getting, you know, I, I think even now I average around four hours. Oh, wow. And and I'm not saying that that's healthy. It's It's definitely not mm-hmm. healthy. And I'm trying really hard to get more. But that is one that is one battle that I've always had to deal with. And back then I still had, um, you know, I I actually remember going to bed probably maybe closer to midnight every night, which isn't too, too bad. But I woke up every morning around five o'clock. So I I woke up really early, early to get an early start of my day. Um, It was also a time when nobody was awake and I got to be, you know, I, I felt like alive because I was alone but also nobody was like governing anything that I was doing. Um, so I, I would get up really early and start my day and, and, and start doing things. And, and I have, I had like a little ritual where I would make myself breakfast. Here's, here's a fun fact. I always, I always love sharing this, why I love cooking. My grandmother. Um, so my, like I said, my mom always told me that I could do anything. And I think that's, that came from her mom telling her that she could do anything mm. as well. Um, but my grandmother taught me how to cook when I was four. Wow. Cause she would babysit me. And when I, when I would wake up in the morning, she would make my breakfast and I would always watch her. And then she, she noticed that I wanted to do it. You know, if I see something, I want to do it. Yeah. And so she just, she just taught me how to, first she taught me how to make my own eggs. And then from eggs, I went to, 
you know, I'm Filipino, so I make rice for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and dessert. <laughs> and and so I learned how to make my own rice, and then uh-huh. I learned how to make at other four. dishes. Oh, at four, yeah. Oh my God. And then eventually, she just left the stool at the at the at the stove, and she just trusted me to do it all on my own. Mm. And so every morning. When, you know, now I'm, I'm six, seven, eight years old, I'm at the house, I'm making my own breakfast. Uh, I always wanted to make breakfast for my siblings, but I, I just felt like they wouldn't want what I made. So I didn't. Mm. But I, you know, I, I always made my own breakfast. I always made my own food. Um, dinner was probably the only meal that was cooked for me because that was when my mom came home. But every meal I made my own food. So, so I had this morning ritual every morning. And that definitely had a big deal in, in why I always thought that I was a lot more than what people thought I was. Mm. Mm. Wow. Question. And when you were surrounded with your family and mm-hmm. you were given constant opportunities to like, hey, you want to learn how to cook? Come sit. Right. <laughs> you, there was no medication in, in the picture. Oh, no, then, no, no, no. Right? It wasn't until I moved to New York City and I, I, whatever I, yeah. grade second or third is, that is the age when it started. It. And a question for you. And I don't know if how if you can if if there's even an answer but hypothetically had you had you continued to be surrounded by your fam- the your extended family and supported by the extended family when you moved how do you think your behavior would have been or um Hmm. Would there have been, and again, it might be a hard one to answer. Well, it's kind of like, is it, would it's there a still, a, yeah. yeah, would there still have been a need to act hmm. out because you did have quite a bit of attention there? Right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I used to get in, in a different kind of trouble. It was probably just, you know, um, running around too much or, or getting hurt or something. And that was the kind of trouble I used to get into. But, um, I think if my family was around, um, I had an uncle, uh, Tito Omar. Um, he was, he was really loving. He was pretty awesome. And, uh, he was there with us as well. And I, I, not that I saw him as a father figure, but he was definitely a male role model. Yeah. And having him around was definitely good. Yeah. Um, eventually, you know, stuff happened. A lot of my family wasn't documented at the time. So he was deported. And he, so he's in the Philippines now, but, um, I think if I was around him a little bit more, I, I would have, I would definitely have a lot more male role models in my life other than just my brother. Not that my brother wasn't bad, but he was still figuring it out too. And he needed some too. Of course. So him not having a male role model and me not having one, it, it definitely made a big deal. I think having at least one would have made a difference. And, and that was definitely my, my uncle, my, my Tito Omar. Mm. Now, maybe jumping forward here, but you also were, uh, you also joined the armed forces. That's right. Yeah. Tell us about that. That's, that's a, that's a hard story. I, uh, my, so my brother and sister were really good scholars. Oh, had, had, didn't have, just have good grades. They were in all of the, you know, most difficult classes, whatever they were called back then. Um, I think it's advanced placement. APs. Yeah. APs. And, and they had high grades for everything. They had good SAT scores, all of those things. Um, but, you know, this was uh, during, this is right after my parents divorced. My, my stepdad and my mom. Uh, my stepdad, my mom found out that he was cheating on her. And, and so she kicked him out. And he was our primary breadwinner in the house. You know, she she made money too. She She had a job. She was a secretary. But he also made money too. So without him, we no longer had, um, a large chunk of change that we had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so now my brother was going to Binghamton university upstate New York. And shortly after that, my, my sister followed him at Binghamton university and the tuition is expensive, especially since it's hard to get, um, a scholarship or financial aid. If, if technically we don't, you know, exist, they were, they were undocumented at the time. So we no longer had a way of supporting them. And I thought to myself, I'm like, wait, if, if we don't have a way of paying for their college, how are we going to pay for my college? And so I, I, I now at the same time, I, I will, I've always said that I've joined to help pay for my sister's tuition. But the truth is I, I did that, but, but in all honesty, I did it because I didn't know what to do with myself. I didn't, I was trying to figure out who I was as a man there. My brother was no longer at home. My sister was no longer at home. Uh, it was just my mom and myself. 
And my mom was super depressed from her divorce. You know, she found out her husband was cheating on her. Mm. And so I was kind of alone. I, I was working five jobs. Uh, this is this is a fun wow. part. I, I was... Um, I, don't, I didn't even know you could work five jobs. I thought three was the max, but oh, you oh, topped it. Oh, yeah. I, I was definitely... Uh, my first job was when I was 13. And... Uh, but... I was I was just a you know cash register person at a internet cafe, and then um, I had some really close friends who had their parents owned a restaurant, and they allowed me to become a host, so I became a host and then a waiter and then a bartender, and then I started bartending in other places. Um, by the time I was by the time I was sixteen, I was I was bartending, I was teaching gymnastics, I was teaching a dance class. And, uh, and then I started working at Dunkin' Donuts and Baskin Robbins. Wow. All at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. What? Mm -hmm. And you can bartend at 16? No, <laughs> that is not, that is definitely not allowed. Only no. in your. <laughs> yeah. I mean, wow. you know, some of the places that I was bartending were, it wasn't like there was a bunch of illegal activity going on, but clearly there was some people on the staff that were underpaid. Hey, it's okay. They were a little underpaid, but that was just so that the business could stay afloat. Right. And I know there's probably child labor laws against it, but if it wasn't for that, I, I would not have been able to have that work experience or, yeah. or even make money. Yeah. Um, and I was noticing that it wasn't enough to support a family. It wasn't enough to support tuition. It wasn't uh, none of that. But I, I also, my, my grades were okay. I wasn't, you know, some stellar student. And I just didn't know what to, to do. I had no direction. I had no dreams. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know. I, I didn't even have a college I wanted to go to. There was nothing that interested me. Um, and my best friend across the street, uh, his name is Aaron Ortiz. His, his father, Steven Santiago, his stepfather actually, was uh, in the army. He was in the army reserves. And he was, he was, he was probably the closest thing that I saw to... Um, uh, a healthy husband, father uh, mm. type figure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, his, his kids were definitely afraid of him. Mm -hmm. You know, they were afraid of him. But uh, I also noticed how much love he gave to them as well. Mm. Um, and, and at the same time, they loved him too. They, were, they would get mad at him for being super strict. But at the same time, when, when, when they saw him, it was nowhere near what I felt when I saw my stepfather. Yeah. And just for our listeners, we have a dog yeah. rodeo going on right now in the yeah. studio. It's beautiful. It's Roxy and Max going mm -hmm. at it. And uh, guys, don't do it outside. Do it right in front of the studio. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. Even though there's all this land. Yeah. But they want to be where the people are. Yeah. Roxy does love being around people. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. It's really funny. When I, when I, when I first got her, uh, I, well, they were telling me about her. They said she's ex extremely expressive. Mm. Um, she loves to play. She loves meeting people. You know, she's not she's not afraid of people. She's not afraid of dogs. She's not afraid of life. Uh, so she'll she's curious, um, but she can also get sassy. You know, mm -hmm. she she doesn't always like being told what to do. So sometimes she'll just be like, oh, really, right now. And yeah, when I first pants. saw her, I, I she's a smaller uh, dog, and I wanted a bigger dog. So when I saw her, I was like, oh, I don't think I'm going to keep her. And then I thought about it and I was like, oh, man, that's exactly what I was always afraid people would say about me. Mm. Because, because in, in, in actuality, all of the things that she is is exactly what I am. Mm. And I was like, oh, no way. No, I'm keeping her because, because that's exactly what I'm afraid of. And I'm sure that's exactly what she's afraid of. So now she's mine. That's awesome. I love how they're being hyperactive, impulsive, restless, all of the good ADHD stuff that could yeah. be medicated. But guess what? If you give them some space to run around and mm -hmm. to be themselves, they're just beautifully unique, you know? Because with Max, mm -hmm. it was in a similar story. He was medicated. He was on Prozac. We were told he he's um, that we need to keep him in an area with high fences because mm -hmm. he will try to escape. Mm -hmm. When in reality, all he needed was just space mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. to have freedom within, and he wasn't going to escape. No, he, and remember, they even said put him in a in a uh, one of those, uh, what is it called? Not a cage, a kennel, like. Oh, I don't know. I don't lock know. him have, in in the room, and then have you know have him in a kennel, yeah. and I was like a crate, a crate. Yeah, thank uh, you. Well, I, there is a little bit of science to having a crate, but it doesn't have to have a door. 
Right. It, yeah. But it's like a den to make them feel safe. But if yeah. this whole place is the den, I mean, the we den. just never felt like he needed it. He, mm-hmm. we, we did think about it because when we first took him home, he was very skittish, very mm-hmm. scared. So we thought maybe that helps. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, but anyway, back to your story. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. so you were present to your uh, your your neighbor's father who was in yeah. the reserves. Yeah. And, and then after you, meeting, after... Um, my so Aaron and I talked about it. We, there's a program where we could join the army together and enlist and you know work together the whole time, and we were like, "Whoa, that sounds amazing!" But he was ready to go as soon as possible. So at 17, he was like, "I'm going." I'm like, "All right, I'm going with you." Hmm. But when you're 17, you need to have your consent from a parent. And my mom said no, and his parents obviously said yes. So he left before I did. And a year later, I, I was like, well, clearly my mom doesn't want me to do this. So I decided to just go on my own. And I, I didn't tell anybody. I just, I wrote a letter on a piece of paper. I, I think, I forgot what it said. I, I think it said like left for the army. <laughs> and I, I slipped it under my mom's um, door and, I, and then I left. Um, but the decision, the decision came mostly because I didn't know what to do. And I, and I was looking for something. I didn't know what I was looking for. You know, I was, I was very much alone at the time. Not that I, I don't blame my mom at all for this because I, I can't imagine to, I can't imagine what it felt like for her to deal with what she was dealing with. And, and at the same time, while trying to raise three kids on her own, yeah. especially when two of them are, are in college and she has no idea how she's going to pay for it. Um, and then especially if, if one of them was about to think about going to college. So I, I didn't, I just, it was a no brainer. I was like, I'm going to, I'm just going to, I'm going to do this. And for the next four years, I'm going to commit to this and I'm going to do my best. And I'm going to prove to everybody that I can, I can be more than just, you know, the retarded chink that everybody thought that I was. Mm. And, and that was actually, um, the, 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 the interesting part was during the, um, the processing of me becoming a soldier, at no point did anybody ever ask if I had any, uh, disorders mental or learning or, mm. or anything. Mm. And I was like, oh, well, if you're not going to ask, then I'm, I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not going to mention it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to give this up. And, um, so nobody in the military thought that I was different. Nobody in the army thought that anything was wrong with me. And just to, so you were already off medication by then? Yes. Once my parents divorced, I think I was around 14, 15, 16, around that age. Mm. That was when, uh, I was off medication. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So you're in, in the army now and mm-hmm. everybody thinks you're normal. You've got a good amount of energy and mm-hmm. you're distracted or disruptive, but that's cool. It's just part of being, you like, know, what's interesting, you know. uh, uh, in the army, there's, they, they take so many people and this is in 2007 and mm-hmm. in 2007, there was a lot more, you know, stuff going on overseas and, uh, a lot of Americans were passing away. So they started lowering the standards of what it means to be a soldier Mm. um, because they needed more men and not enough people were signing up. Mm. So when I looked around, I, I noticed that there was a lot of people just like me. Mm. They had a hard time sitting still. They had a hard time doing all the things that, you know, what you would expect a soldier to do. Mm -hmm. And, and the cool thing about basic training and all of that stuff is, is they, they shave your head. They, you know, they, they, they kind of force you to renounce all of the things that you were before. It's like, oh, are, are you from New York? Oh, you're proud to be a New Yorker? You're not a New Yorker anymore. Wow. Uh, oh, oh, you're Filipino? Oh, you're proud to be Filipino? You're not Filipino anymore. And, and in those moments, I, I, really, I really thought about it. I was like, you know what? I'm, I am American. You know, right here, right now, and according to everybody around me, I'm American. And everybody might have a thing, or maybe one person might be more racist than the other, or, or whatever. But when I looked around, I saw black people, I saw brown people, I saw white people. And it was predominantly white, because uh, I signed up to be in the infantry. And the infantry is pretty much where um, all the action happens. You know, where the, where the bullet sponges, you know, where the front line, all of that stuff. And... Um, it's predominantly white. There's not a lot of culture in it. There's not that many other races in it. And I did experience some racism in the beginning, but once I proved myself, uh, nobody cared. Even, even people in my unit, in my, in my team, 
you can tell they had a little bit of racism in them, but when it came down to it, they, they just didn't care. They're like, no, I need this person. This, this person is part of my team. You know, maybe I don't like the way he does this or that, but he can do his job. So he's part of it. Mm. And, 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 you know, sometimes it's a little, it's a little iffy to think that, oh, you're only measured by what you're able to do. But at the same time, for a, for like a, a place for me, when everybody always told me that I couldn't do things and now I'm being appreciated because I can do all the things. And I, and I was, and you know, I'm not going to puff my chest, but I was, I was better than a lot of the people. And, and it was really interesting. My, my first uh, squad leader, his name is uh, Tyler class. He, he was really young. He was really, he was only like a couple years older than me, but, um, some people got injured, some people passed away and he got promoted much quicker and he was in charge of me. And it, it was an interesting relationship in the beginning because it was hard for him to transition to becoming a leader because he wanted to do it the right way. He didn't want to just, you know, uh, do what he was told. He wanted to do what he thought was right. And there were many times where I made mistakes because I make mistakes and, in, and he would be really hard on me, but it wasn't that he was just hard on me. He was hard on everyone. And, and that made me feel good because, because it made me feel like, well, one, he was giving me attention, but two, he was trying to make me better. And, and it worked. It really worked because, um, out of everybody in the team, I, I really took what he said seriously and then I started going to all of these different schools that were really difficult to pass. And I, I was like the youngest to pass. So I went to Ranger School. Um, I went, you know, I went to Airborne School. I went to Air Assault School. Uh, so I, I did all these schools that were difficult. And the only reason soldiers were allowed to go is if they were good enough to go. Hmm. It wasn't like, oh, anybody can take this school. Anybody can go to these classes. Okay. It was like, hey, we're only sending the best of the best. Right. And for some odd reason, he truly believed that I could pass. Many people in in the unit didn't think I could. They were like, "Why are you Why are you sending this kid? This, he's he's eighteen. He's nineteen. He's not going to pass." And so I'm in this school with like twenty five year old, twenty eight year olds. Some of them are are captains. Some of them are lieutenants. Some of them are are really, you know, higher up in the food chain. And here I am, a private, um, you know, eighteen, nineteen, and. Yeah, I have I have one year of Afghanistan under the, my under my belt, and that's that that's enough apparently. That that's enough to get into the school, along with uh, some testing. But I passed, and and not only did I pass, like I was the youngest to pass at the time. So when I came back to my unit, everybody had no choice but to acknowledge my abilities, and and wow. that was like he was he was probably the first uh, leader, or or person that I followed, that um, truly believed in me. And he had no idea that I was diagnosed with any kind of disorder. Wow. And that's, that's, that's amazing. And because what I'm also hearing is that the army provided you with a structure where there were multiple, where you were thriving. Yeah, very where much Where you so. had multiple schools that you kept on, up, you know, moving on mm -hmm. and, and thriving and thriving and thriving. And what would you say is the quality that had you thrive in that context? Because how I would normally think of the army is like, okay, you ha there's a lot of discipline. You mm -hmm. had to follow a lot of rules, which are the things that traditional education, you could say, is how you thrive. You just follow, you follow orders, right? Mm -hmm. you, but it, how would you categorize the difference ah, of the army? Because you okay. clearly really thrive yeah, here. Yeah. So this is, um, this is something that uh, most soldiers are taught not to do. And basically it's, you're not supposed to volunteer. If you, if you stand out, it's kind of like, dude, you're going to have to do so much work. So don't, don't stand out. Try to be just like everybody else. And, uh, I always apologize. I was like, I'm sorry guys, but I'm somebody who likes to stand out. <laughs> oh, and, um, uh, here, here's, here's an example. Uh, in ranger school, there is, uh, an obstacle course and, in the very beginning, we're all there in the front. It's kind of like a, I don't know, it's one of the first few weeks and there's a rope. And one of the instructors goes, who knows how to climb this rope? And um, in high school, I, I did a little bit of gymnastics. So I was like, oh yeah, I can do this. So I, I, got, I rose my hand. I'm the only person to volunteer. You know, nobody wants to volunteer. Mm -hmm. Everybody there has a lot more experience in the military. They know volunteering is a bad idea. I go, nope, I'm volunteering. And so I go to the rope. I, uh, I sit on the ground 
and I, I, I pulled my legs out in an L shape, like, like I did in gymnastics, and I climbed the rope with just my arms. And I climb all the way up, I climb all the way down. And I'm clearly showing off. I'm clearly showing off my ability. I'm, you know, I'm being a little conceited and cocky at the moment. And the instructor goes, great. So this is the beginning of the opso course. You have to climb this rope, climb back down, run the opso course, come back around and do this 10 times. And um, he basically said, everybody else, however you need to get to the top of this rope, you get to the top of this rope and you get back down and you do this opso course. Men Chavez, you're going to climb just like that all 10 times. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I get it. Yep, that was a mistake. <laughs> and and uh, I laughed, but then I just thought, you know what, uh, I'm going to do it. And I did it. And so I climbed, I climbed the rope exactly how I said, all the way up, all the way down with just my arms. And I did it 10 times and I finished. And so now everybody knows who I am. The entire group remembers who I am now. I'm the idiot who volunteered and did the thing. And um, this, ha this kept happening in the military for me, where you know, they would ask, oh, who? here's another one. In combatives, when we're learning how to fight, um, they were like, all right, um, anybody's allowed to challenge whoever. And uh, you know, nobody's saying anything. So I, I was like, I'll go. And I, I went in the middle and like, all right, who do you want to go with? And I looked for the biggest guy. And I said, that one. And his name is Winkleman. Uh, I haven't talked to him since then, but I remember he was like, are you, are you serious? And so he came in and I just, I just did exactly what I was taught and I won. And, and so now people are starting to recognize like, okay, this guy's really cocky. He's really conceited. He's really, he's really into himself. But for me, it was just, I was trying to prove to myself mostly that I'm, I'm better than I, I think that I am. Mm. And, and that, and that I was right all along that I really am capable and that there's nothing wrong with me. And I was constantly trying to prove this to myself from the entire time I was in the military. And it probably them. wasn't until I was out that I, I finally believed it. It's almost like using the audience, everyone else to actually prove to yourself mm -hmm. that, that you matter, mm -hmm. that you can do this, right? Mm -hmm. You're not stupid. You're not weak. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I will say, though, it was very difficult. There are many classes where we're sitting and it's just like a regular class in you know public school. And those were very difficult for me. But one thing that they did allow in every single school in the military that I've ever been to, they said, if you need to stand up, you can stand up and go to the back and, you know, whatever, just keep paying attention. And that made a big difference. So all of a sudden I would just stand up and then I, I realized, oh, I'm, I'm just going to stand up for all of the class. And standing up for me made it, made it really easy for me to pay attention because then I would stretch, mm. I would move around. Uh, and then if I was in the back of the class, I might be distracting to the instructor, but not to the other students. And I think that's what was always important in school was that I, I can't be distracting to other students, in which, which I was. I was very mm. disruptive mm. in school. I, I, you know, I definitely distracted other students. But that's a great uh, example of what, what we always talk about is that if kids with so-called hyperactivity need to move their bodies and we say, no, that's not normal. You, you need to sit down. You're not supposed to climb a tree right now. You're not supposed to run mm -hmm. around. Mm -hmm. Then essentially, we're not allowing someone who might be able to learn that way to be in the classroom and continue getting right the, the information we then say you need to be medicated so you can learn the yeah. same way which is st sitting still like someone else and this is a good example out in the world not even in a school you're now out in the you know in the army as an adult right realizing oh i can actually learn that way mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right i mean i think that's a huge that's a great example I've, i haven't heard that example so and very I simple right I always, I was always afraid because um, learning details was so difficult for me. Learning details was just, it, it, like that meant that I had to read the book and memorize right. information. And I was never good at that. And so I, I was like, how am I supposed to figure this out? And uh, many times in the army, they, they wanted us to memorize certain things. They wanted us to memorize all of this, the specs on weapons. Sure. And I was like, what, how am I supposed to memorize these numbers? And then I thought about it and I'm standing there and I'm looking at the pictures and it's showing, it's showing that this weapon shoots this far 
and shoots this fast. And then so I, I started looking, I'm like, wait, 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 I can I can remember that because that's that's tangible. Like that's that's something that I, I need to know. So then I started I started remembering the distance a weapon can shoot because I needed to know how far it could shoot. But you were doing it through the visual. Yeah. Well, it was but, visual, but it was also in my head. Yeah. It was like, well, now I need to know how far that is. How far is 300 meters? And then all of a sudden, I, I was starting to recognize how far 300 meters was. Because depending on how big a human being is, that's how far 300 meters is. And, and then also... Um, that's brilliant. Like you were learning how to learn for yes. you. It was tailor made oh, for yeah. like you were providing oh, yeah. your own tools for you to absorb the information you wanted to absorb. That's that's um, brilliant. That's exactly that's exactly it. I was going to get to that. The, in the military, that was where I learned how to learn my way. Wow. And hmm. and once once I figured that out, I I was actually really excited because I I figured I was like I can I can do this anywhere. Yeah. And um, I, I applied that to pretty much every single thing in the army, and I, I promoted way faster than everybody else, which hmm. was challenging socially because all the people that I was that I came in with uh, were now uh, like beneath me, and I had to they, I was in charge of them. Uh, one of my one of my uh, soldiers, he passed away uh, uh, a few years ago from a motorcycle accident. He and I started at the same time. We got to the unit at the same time. And um, because of what I chose to do, I promoted faster. And next thing I knew, he was my soldier. And it was kind of a difficult relationship, but he understood that I had something that he didn't have and that he didn't want to do. And so we eventually became really close. But it was it was interesting, to say the least, to see that I really wanted to push myself and I really wanted to see what I could do in the military and, and especially like what, what it has to offer. Um, I, I also felt a little bad because um, my superiors thought that I was going to do it forever because I, I worked so hard. So to them, they saw somebody who was so dedicated that he wanted to do this forever. And so they gave me special attention as well because I was so I worked so hard, um, but I, I ended up leaving exactly when I when my contract was over. They thought I was going to reenlist and and keep going. And so, I have a question for you. Yeah. Being that you, what I'm hearing is that you you learn how to learn. Mm -hmm. You learn how to learn for you. Mm -hmm. So because of that, you were able to thrive mm -hmm. in this context that the army provided and, and ascend and, and move forward. Being that you have been in medication before, so you know what it's like to be in medication. How would the ex hypothetically again? I'm just throwing hypothetical. Please. How how would how, hypothetically how how do you think your experience would have been had you ad continued to adhere to medication? Would you have discovered these um, new you know like continue to look for how you can learn your way or would? I'm I'm actually scared to think of it. I I feel like I would probably, um, well. Just from just from what I've experienced, um, a lot of a lot of the people that um, were in that class with me needed help. I, I don't I don't think they needed it, but they thought they needed it. I was just going to ask that: Were there other uh, soldiers that um, were considered ADHD or were on meds or known to be, you know? Um, I think that. Uh, like myself, they all hit it mm. because, um, is it, is it one of those things where if you have a mental disorder, you may not get cho chosen for, Oh yeah. You can't move up kind of thing. Uh, I don't, I don't even know if they would, if, if it was, it was, if it was a documented fact that everybody knew then, and everybody was aware of, I don't think we, they would have been allowed in. So there's, I a, don't think, I don't think they would have felt comfortable to send somebody with a disorder um, to war and mm -hmm. not not because they don't think that they're capable but because probably the soldiers around them wouldn't feel safe got it yeah. so you think there's still in the armed forces uh, 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 sort of public facing statement uh, facing statement that says we don't you can't really come in here if you have a d mental disorder we don't take people with mental disorders I think uh, I'm not gonna say that that's true I'm not going to say it's true now, but back then, 
I definitely believe that if, if they knew I had something, they wouldn't have let me in. And you didn't have to show any of those medical records? No. No, the, they, well, when I got there, they asked me for them and I said I had none. Got it. They were like, hey, do you have any medical records? And I said, oh, no, um, I'm a clean bill of health. And, you know, they tested me, they, you know, they, they checked me, they made me walk on, you know, they, oh, do a duck walk, mm -hmm. do this and that. They inspected all these things and they said, yep, he's fine. Go ahead. He's not colorblind. But see, what's fascinating to me is that, you know, absolutely it makes sense. It's why would the army allow people with mental disorders? But at the same time, you know, ADHD has the word disorder in it, mm -hmm. yet ADHD also quality is also descriptive of qualities like hunter qualities, qualities mm -hmm. that, that, you know, you need to be with you know do you want to speak a little bit more about the hunter yeah, yeah. <laughs> that I mean, qualities that actually help you thrive in high stress environments right like yeah this is based on the tom hartman's hunter versus farmer um theory where the adhd brain uh genetic genetically comes handed down from the hunter days where mm. you had to be impulsive and you know uh, hyperactive mm. to to not die right and so it's almost like, isn't that what the army wants? You want people who can be alert, so hyper alert and hyper focused that they're not going to die, right? And so in essence, I believe, I mean, this is a, a hypothesis, that a lot of uh, uh, soldiers have ADHD. It's just that they manage it because they, know, they now can use it for the good. They now mm -hmm. can use it to combat, to be in combat, to... Uh, to stay up all night, right? To, to be awake, to be alert. Um, so it's almost like um, if, yeah, we're going to close the door on the dog. Sir, you guys have been amazing. Our audience has been hearing good dog wrestling. Um, but it's also nice to breathe and, mm. <laughs> and be present to uh, just, just your conversation. But yeah, so... I so don't know. I don't know if, if, if that's necessarily what they want. But I, I do know that... I always had, I always had more in the tank. We would walk, you know, from sun up till sundown, and with with like you know lots of heavy weight on my back, and um, you know there's danger just around every single corner. And when everyone was tired, I still had more, and mm. I, and it wasn't necessarily like physically more. It was it was definitely something more emotional and in my brain, mm. and. And the only few times that I was really, really, really like completely taxed and out of it was when I had fleas. Fleas, just that was it. That was my that was my weakness. I think that is my kryptonite because I never ran into it before. But but fleas in Afghanistan ruined me. I, I broke down and I, I, I totally quit on myself in that moment. But other than that, there was there were so many opportunities that I noticed where mm. I was able to give more than everybody else could. Hmm. And I, I also noticed that a lot of people didn't like it because, because it, you know, it just kept showing to them that I was conceited, but I just wanted to, I wanted to be useful. I wanted to, to help. I wanted to do all these things. I wanted to show, Hey, Hey, I can also do this. Hey, hey, hey I, I can also do that. I mm -hmm. can, you know, I can do that. And I, I always wanted to feel needed, mm. but it was difficult because sometimes, you know, um, they didn't need that. <laughs> they were just like, all right, all right, shut up. <laughs> we well, get it, it. We get it. It also probably kept them, it's it's safer to be at a level where you're comfortable and now this guy's challenging everything and we got to go faster, higher, longer. That's true. We don't want to. <laughs> that's that's definitely true. Um, uh, it's, it's also funny, that same leader, Tyler Class, he eventually got promoted and he got moved to a different team. And so he was no longer my direct leader anymore. And he was like, hey, look, I know, I know that you want to keep doing more. There is another team that if you want to, you can try out and be a part of it. And um, they were the scouts, and it was just pretty much the, the best of the best in our unit. And I was like, oh, that makes sense. I could do that. But um, what do I have to do to be a part of it? And they, they literally just said, you just have to wait for when they have tryouts and when they do show up. But it's, it's difficult because I would have to leave my current team. And so that kind of made me feel a certain kind of way because it was like, oh, but I'm really loyal to these guys. I love these guys. But I also, I'm not being used to my full potential. 
mm. and, I, and I and I had so much more to give, and I wanted to be able to give it. And that's when I that's when I tried out and I made the team, and I not only did I make it made the team, but I became a leader in that team. Nice, nice. Yeah, it was a direct. It was it was immediate. It wasn't even like um, you need to be a soldier here first for a little while before you can lead. It was like all right, here's your team. Nice, mm -hmm. that's great. And I and I took <laughs> I took one of my guys with me, and that's when I took Blake <laughs> with me. I was like, hey, you should try out with me. And he was like, but I'm not, I'm not as good as you guys. I was like, yeah, but if you're next to me, I think it'll work out. <laughs> Rub off. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to jump forward. So you said you finished at the top. You you were done with mm -hmm. the army, mm -hmm. came out of the army. And so now you're facing real life, mm -hmm. right? And um, talk to me about now having the strength, obviously, to overcome anything, because you've seen lots of things. You've done things no... A civilian will ever have to face or mm -hmm. encounter and so you knew yourself as somebody who could do anything mm -hmm. right and so I want to talk a little bit about this um, jack of all trade master yeah. of none yeah 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 we talked about this earlier yeah. how do you feel about that yeah so that's a that's always a fun thing to think about um, when I when I meet people there's always there's always a, a moment where somebody will say so what do you do and I I consider myself an artist First and foremost, above and above anything else, I consider myself an artist, and I think that came from when I got out of the army. Um, I, I didn't, I still didn't really know what to do as far as schooling was concerned, but I did know that I, um, I made a promise that I would try acting. When I was deployed my second year, there was there was quite a few men that um, we fantasized about what it would be like once we got out. And, you know, we loved watching movies together. We would have our laptops out, you know, in the desert, watching whatever it is we're watching. Um, some people had iPods back then with videos on it, and we would watch a movie together. And um, I always loved trying to, you know, reenact some of those scenes just for fun. And eventually some of the guys were like, oh, man, you should try to be an actor. And I was like, ah, that sounds like fun. Maybe. And uh, then somebody said, you know, you could probably just move to L.A. and do it. You know, you can do anything. Just do it. Just go, go and be an actor. Mm -hmm. huh. And I kept thinking about it. And then by the time I got out or by the time we were leaving Afghanistan, uh, I made a promise. I was like, you know what? I'm going to try because, um, you know, I don't I don't have a dream of what I want to do or want to be when I get out of the army. I just I just want to get out and experience what it's like for everybody else. You know, mm. what, it's, what is it like to be a normal human being in the world as an adult? I didn't know what that was. Hmm. And that's when I decided to move to Los Angeles and become an actor. And so I went to community college because I hadn't been in school and I didn't, had, I didn't know what to do in school. And I just started taking acting classes here and there. Um, and the, to be in school and have the military pay for your school, you have to have a full load. So I had all of my general education units and everything that I needed, but I still needed like one or two more units. And I was just walking around cam campus at Santa Monica College, and I saw a room filled with beautiful girls. And I was like, I want to be in that room. <laughs> and the teacher saw me, and she said, do you want to come inside? And I was like, oh my God, yes. <laughs> it was a ballet class. Oh. And so I walk in and the teacher's like, you know, talking about it and she's, you know, she's giving me like a history lesson and I'm like, yeah, 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 whatever. Let me just look at these beautiful women. <laughs> also in the, in the army, in the infantry, there's no women allowed. So I would, I would go a year or so without even seeing a woman. Mm. And, um, this is kind of when my, like my, my sense of smell got really well fine tuned <laughs> because it's the, like a woman would be walking around the corner and I go, I know exactly how many women there are. Yeah. And, um, so I signed up for that ballet class and <laughs> nice. And then the ballet teacher was like, you should sign up for these classes too. And so then I signed up for the other classes. Uh, so I started taking modern classes, modern dance, um, ballet. You had a, a background in, in, in oh, dance as uh, well, right? Kind of. Uh, in New York City, everybody gets bit by the breakdancing bug. It's just kind of how the hip-hop culture goes. There's, there's graffiti, there's rap, there's all these different kinds of styles that you can get into for hip-hop. But for me, um, I felt more comfortable moving around, so breakdancing was what I, what I ended up doing. And uh, I taught a little bit of breakdancing when I was when I was a teenager mm -hmm. too, 
and I performed a little bit with my brother. My brother was a big break dancer. He loved break dancing and he was in a crew. So obviously I'm going to do whatever my brother did. And, um, I, I, you know, I would say I, I was average maybe, you know, I, I could maybe do some of the things that people can do, but I never had a problem doing it in front of people. And that's, that's kind of what made me, um, stand out was that I didn't mind doing it. Whereas some break dancers, they go, Oh no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm good. And so I, I got in this classroom and, and at the time I was about 205 pounds. Um, and that was, that was just all muscle. You know, when I, when I was in the army, I just, I got big, I got strong and I, I just wanted to do whatever it took to be able to do all the things that everybody else is doing. I'm also five, eight. So 205 pounds was, was That's really a big. good amount. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm in this ballet class and, um, I, I have a pretty good understanding of how to use my body. Um, like I said, my brother did Kung Fu and martial arts. So whatever he did, I did. Mm-hmm. And I definitely uh, took it very seriously. And so I got, I got really good at using um, or understanding how to use my body. So ballet became very easy for me to transition into. Modern became very easy for me to transition into. But uh, I think what always gets me um, inspired are good leaders or good teachers. And I had um, my, my first mentor in Los Angeles was Karen McDonald. Uh, and so, you know, I came to Los Angeles to act and I was taking acting classes, but this woman, she really committed to teaching me how to um, take modern dance seriously. And Karen, um, Mrs. McDonald, she, She's a, an Alvin Ailey dancer. She's a choreographer. Um, in the Michael Jackson Thriller video, she's like right there in the mm-hmm. front. And, uh, and I was like, wow, she's amazing. And, and you know, I kind of fell in love with her. Not, not in the sense of, you know, uh, romantically, but I fell in love with how strict she was and how, how much she believed in me, mm. how much she pushed me. And so I'm in the classes. I'm in every single class. Uh, I'm taking her class four days a week you know, three or four hours a day. And, and I, I was really, I was really diving into it. I completely mm. committed myself because it, it became an obsession. And so I would be in that class during the day and then I would go and drive up to North Hollywood to Debbie Reynolds, which is a dance studio in North Hollywood that was really, really world famous. Uh, you know, people from all around the world would, would spend um, three months in America just to train at this place. Mm. And so I was, I was very fortunate that I was able to just show up and take classes. And that's when I started diving into all these different styles of dance from popping and locking to whacking and um, uh, different, like I even got into Bollywood a few times. <laughs> I got into Vogue. I got mm-hmm. into contemporary. I got into all these different styles of movement. And, and it, it just, it all, all of it just came together in a really, in a really beautiful way for me. And so now I, I, met a, I was at a place where I just felt good about how to use uh, movement. And, and every single day, my, my teacher, Karen, would, would notice that something is changing. And she would, she would try really hard to, to, to figure out what it was and, and bring it into the classroom. Hmm. And it wasn't, it wasn't until she had me do a very simple exercise where um, all I'm doing is, is bending my knees and standing up and bending my knees and standing up and using my arms in different ways. Uh, but it was very basic movement. It looks like absolutely nothing if you're watching it from afar. But she just told me to do it exactly the way that I did it a second ago. And I said, okay. And she always had a live uh, a percussionist playing music or a pianist. And I would get really into the music. And uh, so I would close my eyes and I would just really, really allow myself to go to a place where I was doing what I was supposed to be doing, but I kind of expressed myself in my own way still doing the same movement. And, um, by the time I opened my eyes, um, I noticed that she had all the students move out of the way and, uh, everybody was watching and I looked around and and there was a, there was a few people crying and I I didn't really understand what was going on. And she said, that's how you perform. And I, and I was like, Oh, Hmm. I didn't even realize I was performing. And so that's when I got bit by the book, by the bug. I, I wanted to be, I wanted to be on stage. I wanted to perform. And, and then that's, that's kind of when I, 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 I still acted. I, I definitely, I definitely got into quite a bit of few acting things, but dance took over my entire life. Mm. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Because to me, 
um, well, two things. One, it's amazing because you could dive in like deeply into one thing and really get excited about it and go to the next and go to the next, right? And then I wanted to ask, going back to college, mm -hmm. now as an adult, was it easier for you to take certain, because you had to take certain classes mm -hmm. where you mm -hmm. had to sit down, mm -hmm. right, and do homework. Yeah. Was so that suddenly this easier? Is a, this is, this is a, uh, I actually really love talking about this. I, once I figured out how to learn in, in the army, I figured out how to apply it in college. Mm -hmm. and, and so now I was no longer somebody who was just passing. I, I was on the dean's list. Mm -hmm. I had really mm -hmm. high grades, mm -hmm. um, uh, and I and I took the basic classes. I took general education. I took you know I took math. I took science. I took English, um, and and uh, it was my first time enjoying those things. Wow. All of a sudden, I loved writing. All of a sudden, I loved I loved science. Yeah. Um, all of a sudden, I loved. Well, I I didn't really love history just because I I kept you know learning two sides of a different coin where I was like, oh, this is what they're teaching us, but this is what it says on the internet. And, but, but what I noticed was I just needed to find people in the room to not so much help me, but just sit with me and learn with me because I'm, I'm somebody who talks through things. Yeah. So, uh, sometimes a teacher would say something and, um, there wasn't always time to ask questions. You know, there, there was definitely time for dialogue sometimes, but also uh, college was a place where, yes, they're talking at you, but it was also uh, accepted to discuss amongst the people around you. And, mm -hmm. and I always made sure that I told every single teacher that, um, one, that I was a veteran and that I had a hard time sitting still uh, and that I, and I also suffer from PTSD. And so they, they, they were very much, um, respectful. They, they never once tried to silence me. They never once thought of me as just, um, disruptive. Um, and sometimes when, when I would ask a question with the people around me, the teacher would say, could you ask that question for everyone? And, you know, that kind of made me feel like, oh, they're putting me on the spot. But I, I eventually I learned that my questions were questions that the teacher wanted me to ask it, and, and, and so that he can talk about it with everyone so that mm -hmm. everybody could learn it. Yeah. Um, and, and there was, there was a, a bunch of other things too, but what really helped me as well was that, um, the, I'm, I'm, I'm very social. So I, I would, well, whoever was sitting around me in the classroom, I would talk to them outside of class and talk about what we were doing in class. And I would, I would ask like, well, what do you think about this? You know, well, how, how come this is that? Or do you mind explaining this to me? And, and I had no problem, you know, um, everybody was younger than me. I'm, I'm 22, 23. Everybody was 18 coming straight out of high school. And I had no problem just saying, Hey, I, I need help. Mm -hmm. And, and that was, that was all it took. And, mm -hmm. and what I also noticed was a lot of the students that were working with me were also getting really good grades. And it was just because we were talking about topics in the classroom, outside of the classroom. And I think that's what was supposed to happen anyway. Yeah. But, but there's a big thing where you, where at least I was told that I'm supposed to go to the library and study on my own. And I just don't know how to do that. So I would always get groups. I started a group for every single class. And I said, hey, can we get together and mm -hmm. talk about the topics in the classroom? That's great. And so from um, undergrad, where I got my, my degree in acting, and, um, and, and the other thing is, I will also say, for my experience, maybe, maybe it's because of uh, who I am and, and you know, my disorder, but uh, acting was definitely a big part of my healing process for PTSD. Hmm. Because my, my teachers, they always wanted, wa they always wanted expression. And I was like, oh, that's all I ever wanted to do. And, mm -hmm. and they would have me come up when it's my turn. And when I would, when I would act out a scene, um, they, th it wasn't like, oh, okay, he's good enough. Their, their job is to push you wherever you're at. So it doesn't matter how good you are. You could be the best in the room or the worst in the room. They're going to push you a little bit better. Even if you already know what you're doing, they're still going to push you a little bit more. And my teachers, I always told everyone about my past. Uh, I told every single teacher I ever had, like, hey, this is what's going on with me. And, you know, maybe that just made me more memorable. But they always, 
they always pushed me a little bit more. Mm. I always noticed that I was pushed harder than all the other students and everybody always knew that I could take it. Mm. And my, my acting classes would, would, I, you know, we would leave the room in, in like an emotional, you know, just wreck. <laughs> but that was such a big part of my, my transition out. And once I figured out group projects and, and being in um, unison with people, I, I learned, I was like, oh, that's all I need to do to learn. I just need to be with people. I learn better with people and I learn yeah. better than it, it. I learn more from a group of students than I do from a teacher just talking at me. That's amazing. Yeah. You were clear how you learn. Oh yeah. That's, it, it was, cl it clicked right away. Huge. And, and the, the, and my favorite part is, um, that's exactly what everybody was trying to, to learn how to do in graduate school. So I went to graduate school for entrepreneurship. I went to USC oh, wow. and, um, all they ever, all the teachers kept saying were like, you need to find a group to work with. And I was like, oh, great. Cause that's exactly what I was going to do anyway. <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, I, I know there are probably, you know, uh, there's probably a stigma like, oh, well you didn't really do graduate school cause you, you didn't kind of learn it on your own. I'm like, yeah, but we all graduated, you know, my group and I, we all got really, we all did really well. We, we got high test scores. We, you know, and, and of course, at any, any presentation, they were always like, so here are the topics that you need to talk about, EJ, and just go ahead and do whatever you do. I was like, great. Every presentation, I was in the front. Every presentation I, I presented, and I was always the, the guy in the, in the, in the selling or, or whatever it is that we were doing, I, that was always me. So I knew I had a place in, mm. in my group. I always knew I had a place in the school. And it was, it was so easy. I, I, I hate saying it. I hate saying that graduate school was easy, but it, it was. There was some hard parts, of course, but because of how we were doing it, and, and all I really did was just follow what teachers told us to do. Work in groups. Um, do this outside of just this classroom. Don't just wait for us to tell you what to do. Like, Learn all of these things on your own so that when you show up, we can, we can build more on what you learned. And, I, and so I was like, okay, let's, let's all do that. And so we all taught ourselves before the class even started. And then when the class would get there, we already had answers. We already had, we already rose our hand. We were like, oh, that's that thing that was talked about earlier in this, in this video or that video that you showed us. And, and it made a really big difference to just work together with people, um, you know, before and after classes. Wow. That's and, amazing. And, and my graduate school program, it was, it was eight hour days, like wow. four hours with, you know, a 10 minute break here and there. And another four hours, 10 minute break there. That's amazing. And because again, what I'm hearing is like, here you are, you, your school years, right? There were those struggles, they were labeling, there was segmenting into special buckets of, you know, all that stuff. But yet once you got into the army and you, you, you began to thrive there, you went, you got your degree, you thrived there, you got your, your, um, um, my master's, your master's yeah. and, and thrive. Right. Mm -hmm. And parents who have children who have been labeled ADHD, worry a lot as in like okay my child will never go to higher education and mm. yet here you are thriving in all these areas right and what would you say to you know to a parent that has those concerns for a child now because right now they only think that the only way they can do it is if they're medicated mm. and that's the only way how they can achieve a higher education um, and that's also what they're being sold, right? The, from the principal to the teacher that told mm -hmm. us, they said, and if you don't medicate them, then, you know, doomsdays happen hmm. in prison and drugs and all that stuff. Right. Cause that is one uh, possible outcome. That yeah. is true. Yeah. No, I, but, it's, I, I think it's kind of scary. Um, I, I, so one of the things that I do for a living now is I work with, I work with youth empowerment and youth development mm -hmm. and, um, I, I think it's, I, you know, some people call it experiential education where I just take students out and we go on adventures and we have a lot of life lessons, life lessons learned Amazing. through the experience. And it's not necessarily that I tell anybody anything. I pretty much just ask questions like, so how was that for you? Like, what was that? What was it like to um, surf? What was it like to climb this wall? What was it like to mm. hike this trail? What was it like to camp out here without parents and all these things? Mm. And um, I'm always worried to 
kind of give parents advice because there's there's also that fear that's that teachers and principals have that they're not going to be able to do their job correctly because there's some student who's ruining it for everybody else and i've heard that story before because i've worked with different schools and they blame they blame the kid i i think the the one thing that i would would talk about is well what's going on at home and is there any way that in, in my opinion, a child is probably one of the most important things in the home. And and if if they're not the, one of the most important things, then th- maybe there's something else going on. But my parents worked so much that I never got to see them. Mm. And so I kind of was raised by myself and my brother. And, I, you know, as much as I loved it, I don't think that was healthy for me. Mm. I think I needed I think I needed my mom. I think I needed my dad. I think I needed something. And and now I have no relationship with my dad or, or my dad's. And uh, my mom and I have, you know, we I, I call her sometimes because I'm like, okay, I'm supposed to call my mom. I want to call my mom. And I call her and our conversation sounds like, hey, hey, well, how, how are you? I'm doing good. How about you? I'm, I'm doing great. So I went surfing today. I did this, mom, and, and, and this, this, and this. Oh, that's so great. You need to be careful, okay? Okay. Uh, how's, yeah. how's everybody going on at home? <laughs> They're good. And, and that's it. And, Sounds I, and, and I'm, I'm mm-hmm. having a hard time connecting with my mom. And, then, mm-hmm. and I try. I, I want to connect more. But I know that there's probably some things that happen where she just doesn't feel comfortable doing so. Mm-hmm. And so I, I would say, you know, connect with your kids and, you know, be able to have a conversation with them that is more than just, um, you know, the superficial things that you would say to an acquaintance. Mm-hmm. I think I think it's important to be able to talk to your, to not your kids, but I, I always wanted to talk to my mom about things that I was excited about. And um, one thing that my mom and I do share is we love watching movies together. You know, I, I take my mom on dates. We, we go to the movies together and that's that's one of our things that we love to do. And it's just us. And, you know, I'll hold her hand or hold her arm and, and you know, make sure that she knows that I love her. But I, I would love to be able to say something and share some, some things about me. And and we never really get to do that. And so I think I think a conversation at, at a minimum hmm. is is a really big deal. Um, but but I mean, guidance would have been amazing. You know, like uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> having having her there to tell me, you know, certain things. Um, mm-hmm. And the funny thing is the few things my mom has told me, I never forgot. One of the things she used to say was everything I do always bounces off of me and goes to her. And that was her way of saying, be careful of um, doing something that might, you know, get me in trouble because she's the one who's going to get in trouble. Mm. And, and that stuck with me so much, but I was like, but, but mom, you're not even spending time with me. Yeah. And another thing she used to say was, of course, she said that I could do anything. And that always stuck with me, but, but she never got to see it. You know, it wasn't until, uh, uh, I was here in California that she actually saw me dance and, Mm. and I have no, I, you know, I, I do understand why, but, um, after I performed, uh, I, I came outside to see her and my face just just like, I just looked crazy because I just started crying because that was my first time performing in front of my mom Mm. for anything. She's never got to see me do any of the things that I was so good at when I was younger. She, she didn't get to see me fight. I used to fight competitively. Uh, I, I used to, you know, I, I danced with my brother sometimes. We, I don't know if you've ever been to New York, but there's these showtime dancers where it's like, what time is it? Showtime. What time is it? (laughs) Showtime. And then we would break dance. Like she's never seen any of that. Mm. And and I, you know, I just wanted to be seen by the one person that I, that, mm. you know, was always there for me or, you know, supposed to be there for me. So all of those things, I think, I think those are really important things that uh, any kid should have. That's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. What I'm taking away really is, you know, for parents to be present with their children, to listen to them, to acknowledge their reality, what they're going through and to, you know, to, uh, witness their growth and celebrate, celebrate their achievements. Absolutely. And there's a word you use to say you wanted to be seen by her, mm-hmm. which is mm-hmm. such a important, sounds so foundational and basic that mm-hmm. we take it for granted, but like, can we really see our children mm. for who they are, for what they are? And, and, and can we accept them yeah. 
for mm -hmm. how unique they are and how, how perhaps imperfect and not normal they are, which makes them, I think, more beautiful. Right? There was there was this one thing that uh, uh, I had to get used to, which was um, uh, I would come home and no one would be waiting for me. Mm. And, um, you know, when I when I came home from Afghanistan the first time, there were all of these families waiting for, you know, their son, their their husband, um, their father. And there was no there was never anybody waiting for me. And I remember just thinking like, man, mm. I'm just going to have to get used to this because there's nobody that's going to be waiting for me. Uh, my mom came to my basic training graduation, which was wonderful. She brought my uncle. And and I remember in that moment, I was very emotional because I've always wanted that to happen. Mm -hmm. But, you know, coming home from a year long tour in Afghanistan and not knowing if I was going to make it home. And then the second tour, I was like, yeah, nobody's waiting for me. And I just got used to it. And then, um, you know, I started performing on stages and I just got used to nobody being in the audience. And um, then that just became something that I, I actually was afraid of. I, I, start, I started not telling people about things that I was doing because I was afraid somebody would come and just be disappointed. Mm. And, and the reality is that's not true at all. I had a performance in September and it wasn't, it wasn't one of my best shows, but it was definitely one of the most emotional. Um, I did it with a company called Diavolo that are out in downtown. Oh my gosh. And mm -hmm. um, we performed at this beautiful theater in Orange County. And my mom flew in from... New York to go see it. My brother came. Oh. Uh, and then I, I actually invited a lot of people. And there's a moment in, in the show where I just, I walk up to the front of the stage and I say my name. I say, my name is EJ. And uh, the, the feeling I got when I ran up to the front of the stage and I said my name and a loud cheer came over the audience, I had to try so hard to stay in the moment because because I was waiting for that for like my whole life. I, I just wanted to feel that and hear that. And there it was. And, oh, and it felt it so seen. good. Oh I, I was like, I, I was trying so hard not to get emotional, but I was like, well, it doesn't really matter. It's an emotional piece. So let's go with it. <laughs> and so for the rest of the piece, like there's this anguish and, and like, like, you know, there's, there's a lot of emotion on my wow. face, but in reality, it was just, it was just like feeling, feeling like there's so many people here for me and it feels really good. Wow. Mm. Yeah. It's beautiful. Um, I, I just got present to the name of the episode. I, it could be, I just want to be seen. Oh yeah. You know, mm -hmm. because that's really when we see our kids and we're there for them, there's that attention that mm -hmm. they really are after instead of having to get it some other way by being disruptive or by trying to process this all and running around. Right. Which in a way it shifts the name of, of ADHD attention deficit. Mm -hmm. disorder it's like a deficit of attention yeah it's just like we need that attention it. it's not that they can't pay attention it's more like it's i would say you're the perfect proof that you could pay attention <laughs> many times <laughs> over when you wanted to and you figured it out right but it, you didn't have the attention you needed to give attention if it was boring mm -hmm. in school or whatever right I, I definitely um, want to give credit to uh, Michael Waden for uh, a conversation we had last week, because I was talking about I was talking about this with him, and he he literally just said he's like you know I'm just gonna put it out there, but it really sounds like you really wanted to be seen. Mm -hmm. And then when he said that, I was I tried really hard not to cry in front of him, but I it was just like yeah. coming out of my face, and I was like oh, yeah. you're so right. And then ever since then, I've been thinking about it, and I was like wow, yeah. yeah. All yeah. across the board, I just really wanted yeah. people to pay attention because growing up, everybody ignored me yeah. or, or saw me as somebody who was, you know, not worth anything. Right. Yeah. Well, you've made it. Oh, yeah. You are now being seen yeah. and heard mm -hmm. on this podcast. And I thank you for so vulnerably sharing your story. And I, I really got a lot out of it. And I hope our listeners as well, taking away gold, as mm -hmm. we say. Yeah. Uh, EJ and I are part of the K4 Men's Group, mm -hmm. led by Philip Folsom and Joshua, Joshua Warner. Warner. Yeah. And uh, that's how we, well, that's how we met at Phillips. And uh, yeah. I just want to, again, 
put out there that it's really important for us men to step up um, into manhood, to transition from being a boy, a prince, to step mm-hmm. in, into becoming kings, because then we can be there for our families, for mm-hmm. our, our wives, even just our mothers or our family. Because I, I'm a big believer that when fathers leave families, it leaves a huge hole. Yeah. And yeah. then definitely uh, the children feel not seen because that's half of the family gone. Absolutely. And I think that's a big a big reason why a lot of anxiety, fear, depression, and ADHD, things like that, mental disorders in children start to develop, divorces, abuse, and so forth, and that's why we do this show. So thank you so much for sharing your story. Thanks for having me. Um, Our pleasure. Tatiana and I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.